Welcome to the Alan Elkan Interviews, an unprecedented window into the minds of some of the most well-known and respected figures of the last 25 years. We are with Ronald Loder, who is the president of the World Jewish Congress since June 2007. He is emeritus chairman of ST Loder Companies. He is chairman of Clinic Laboratories. He is chairman of the Auschwitz Bikernau Memorial Foundation. And uh, he is chairman of the Ronald S. Loder Foundation. It has the, the merit or the issue to rebuild Jewish life in Central and Eastern Europe. Not only that, but he opened the Neue Gallery in 2001 in New York, dedicated to German and Austrian art. He is also the world's largest collector of medieval and um, Renaissance armors. Ronald Loder, you have all these jobs. You also were Deputy Defense Secretary for Europe and NATO in 1984. In 1986, you were U.S. Ambassador in Vienna. You have long-standing ties with Israel and its leader. I come to my question. How would you define yourself? An eclectic personality? Eclectic, I don't know, but many personalities. But perhaps the most important today for me is the question of world of the World Jewish Congress. And this is something that I feel very strongly about. And we see a huge uptick in anti-Semitism in countries throughout the world, including your own country, Italy. I am still involved in Neue Gallery. I'm still an art collector. I'm still very much involved in Auschwitz Birkenau Foundation. We just honored all the survivors at the 75th anniversary of liberation of Auschwitz, of which I gave the keynote speech. I also am very involved in Israel, particularly the Negev, where we have an employment center, and we're bringing many, many young people to the Negev. Are you still involved in Estee Lauder Company, and has the company changed since uh, your parents, Esther, Estee, and Joseph died? I'm on the board of directors. As you said, I am chairman of Clinique, which is one of our largest brands. And I'm involved with the company because of the board of directors, because of the family, almost on a daily basis. The company, yes, has grown dramatically since my parents died. My mother died in 2004, so it wasn't that long ago. But the fact is that today, ST Lauder is growing very, very much. It is one of the leading corporations, not only in the cosmetic business, but in the United States as a corporation, as well as a worldwide company. Your mother was an exceptional woman. What did she taught you? Every meal we had was about business. I learned it, and I worked with her 17 years in the business. She was a brilliant woman. I should mention my brother, Leonard, who was the CEO of the business for many, many years is now Chairman Emeritus, has just written a book about his time growing up in ST Lauder and what it meant. But the real aspect is, it was truly a family business. And from the time I can remember, as a child, we heard about stores, we heard about ideas, we heard about products. There was always products on the table that everyone was trying to see to find the best product. So it was a very, very much a hands-on business. And it was a very Jewish family? I mean, were you very much involved into religion or charity or it came afterwards? Both. It is. We're a Jewish family. At the same time, my own Jewishness came many, many years later because I was a very much assimilated Jew. It wasn't until I came to Vienna. I'm as ambassador. And I saw Jewish children who came out of the at that time, the Soviet Union, what was they were going through, that I started getting involved with schools and education. And slowly but surely, I became more and more involved in education. And strangely enough, it was the anti-Semitism that I saw and the children and the effect they had on children 
that turned me into a much more uh, committed Jewish person than I was prior to that. You are old in the sense of many years a Republican, and you have helped the party in many ways. And I think you were appointed in Vienna by President Reagan. Right. And since then, you became very interested, as I said at the beginning in your introduction, into Central and Eastern European Jews. Is that because of your origin? Is it because you were in Vienna? Is it because of the Holocaust? All of the above. My family came out of what was known then as the Austrian-Hungarian Empire. They came from Hungary. They came from uh, Lower Austria. They came from the part of the Czech Republic. So the result is, is that it's a mixture for me on both sides of the family. I was always fascinated by Eastern Europe and where it was. And in many ways, when I thought of Europe as a teenager, I always thought more of Eastern Europe. And I was fascinated by the Iron Curtain and what it meant. It was fascinating for me. And you also uh, worked, as we said, as Deputy Defense Secretary for Europe and NATO, right? 83 to 86. The real aspect is that those three years were very full years for me. And I went to all the NATO countries, worked very, very hard to help our defenses, to help what can be done, to keep the United States very involved with all the NATO countries sharing the defense spending. And I got to know all the defense ministers and it was a fascinating job. At the moment, your focus is very much into the World Jewish Congress. So can you tell us what is the World Jewish Congress? It was founded in 1936-37 by a group of Jewish people who came working in Geneva and they saw what was going to happen in Nazi Germany. And they tried to warn the world, particularly the Jewish world, what was happening. But because they had very little influence, no one heard them until it was too late. And Nachman Goldman, seeing this was part of it, said, look, we're going to make a Congress that's going to have strength and be able to talk to governments. And um, for the last 70 years, let's say, we've seen what can be done. And the fact is that today, my job, I'm in almost daily contact with many, many of the European countries, one after the other after the other. And what's happened is that we are fighting anti-Semitism. We are working together to help the Jewish communities. We are working very closely with Israel and what they're doing. I've made five trips over the last six months to the Middle East, to other countries who are part of the Abraham Accord, and that's had a major effect on Israel. So again, the job of the World, President of the World Jewish Congress, in many ways, is to represent the Jewish people all over the world. You talk of diaspora Jews, I mean, American Jews, European Jews. No, but diaspora Jews plus Israel. We also represent Israel. So there is Jews all over the world, and the majority are in six or eight countries. But the fact is, is that we represent Jews in communities of only 100, 200 people. We represent them. It's not an easy task to fight against anti-Semitism. And it's, it's coming. growing and growing. Right after the Second World War, when people saw the atrocities of what the Nazis did to the Jewish people, nobody wanted to be associated with Nazis and what happened. We are now three generations later, and we're seeing now that young people do not really and truly understand what happened during the Holocaust. And there's something that pulls a lot of young people into these anti-Semitic or neo-Nazi movements that you wonder what is happening. That's on the right. On the left, because using Israel as an anti-Israel function, a new form of anti-Semitism is the entire thing of people using the excuse of Palestine to attack Israel and attack Jews in general. You are a Republican, and uh, you were not only in school at the Walton School of Economics but you, you, with Donald Trump, but you also supported him in his campaign. What do you think about the result of the elections, the behavior of Trump after the result of the election, 
And what do you think about the new government of Joe Biden? First of all, as a Republican, I am always very supportive of the Republican Party. But as president of the World Jewish Congress, it's my job to be friendly and close with every president. And I've been close with every president since Richard Nixon. And um, although I've known President Trump for 50 years, I've known Joe Biden over 40 years, and I have a very, very good relationship with him too. What happened in in the Capitol um, after the election is unfortunate. I think it's a disaster for all. But at the same time, rather than looking at the one event, we have to look at the four years of what Trump did. He did many good things. And there are things that I don't agree with. There are things I agree 100% with. And I'm sure that during the Biden administration, there are things I'll agree 100% with and the things I'll disagree with. President Trump before has opened your embassy, U.S. embassy in Jerusalem, and there was a lot of work done in the process of peace with the Emirates, with the Arab countries. You think that uh, Joe Biden is going to look forward to go on the same line? One of the first things he said is that he's keeping the embassy in Jerusalem and that he is going to keep the Abraham Accords and what was accomplished by by the administration. And the fact is that there are changes going on. One of the things Biden is trying to do is build a strong relationship with Europe. And the real question for all of us in the entire world, not only for the U.S., but for Italy and every other country, is what's going to happen with Iran. What do you think is going to happen in the Middle East, in Israel, and in Iran? I believe that the Biden administration will find a way to stop Iran from having a nuclear weapon. However, there is two different philosophies. The philosophy of the Trump administration was what you should do is put sanctions on them and attack them and really and truly make it a case that it's not to their advantage to have a nuclear weapon. And the Biden administration believes very much I know, and, and sitting down and talking and negotiating with them. They're both ways to accomplish it. But the fact is, we must accomplish it. Because if Iran has a nuclear weapon, so will Saudi Arabia, so will all the other countries in the Middle East. And you'll have a very, very difficult time. So I say to you, the next year will be extraordinarily important for all of us in, in the world of what happens. And... Um, I know from my friends in both the Biden and the Republican administration, we really and truly want to see an agreement made. There's a question about what the agreement should handle, but we have no choice but to make an agreement. And uh, how is the position of Israel in this situation? Well, you know, interesting, as you know, there's an election taking place. uh, But there are elections all the time. And... When one reads your biography, you are considered a good friend uh, of President Netanyahu. The Prime Minister Netanyahu. I know his philosophy. And although there's election going on, there is very little difference between his philosophy and the, his opponent's philosophy or what should be done. Both cases, they do not trust Iran to stop. And remember, they're surrounded by Hamas and Hezbollah. And do you think this kind of opening with the Emirates and eventually with Arabia, it's very important for Israel and for the international community? I think the Abraham Accords were critical for the future of the world because of the fact that if you have a strong Middle East, and I just wrote a piece about in the Arab news talking about NATO, that the Middle East should have a type of NATO working together. I think just as I saw what it did in Europe to stop the Soviet Union, I also can see what it could do in the Middle East using Israel as the American, so to speak, in the Middle East to have an effect on what's happening in the Middle East about nuclear weapons and weapons in general. There is another big issue in the American politics. It's China and the United States. What do you think about that? I think that it's 
extraordinarily important for China and the U.S. to become friendlier, to work together, because there's no other choice. Their economies, in many ways, depend on each other. And as they work together, it helps the, the global economy. A fight between the two, I believe, will hurt the economy of the world. It's very hard to be an optimist, but I'm an optimist. As an art collector, you specialized in German and Austrian art, opened the Neue Gallery in New York. You are the largest collector, one of the largest collectors of the painter Egon Schiele. For a huge amount of money you purchased, at the time it was $135 million, the very famous portrait of Adele Bloch-Bauer by Gustav Klimt. And they say that you call it your Mona Lisa. Why such a passion for the Viennese secession? It goes on with your time in Vienna. It has to do with that. My collecting of Schiller and Klimt preceded my time in Vienna by about 20 years. I started collecting Schiller and Klimt when I was a teenager, when <laughs> no one had heard of them. I started, I guess I was about 14 or 15 by then. And to me, I've never stopped buying. I just purchased a piece of, a piece of Austrian art a month ago. And it's part of what I'm about. At the same time, I collect many of the fields. I never stopped collecting. You gave 91 uh, yeah. pieces of medieval and Renaissance armor last year to the Met, to the Metropolitan right. Museum. It's different things. One has to eat, one eats fish, one eats steak, one eats... Vegetables. And when did you start this other passion of yours? I started when I was 17, 18 in different fields. My first piece of medieval art I bought when I was 19 years old. And my first piece of armor I bought when I was 21. I've been collecting a long time. There was a famous author named Pierre Caban who describes collecting as almost like taking heroin. Once you're on it, you never stop. I'm a collector. I collect everything. You also have a collection of telephones. Right, exactly. I've got 30 or 40 telephones. I collect many different things. I'm into collecting now Greek and Roman sculpture, ancient Greek helmets, things from the Middle Ages, from the Renaissance, old master paintings, contemporary art. How can you love so I many different with my things? Eyes. With my eyes. I see things and I understand what's good and what's not good. You know, I have three categories. Oh, oh my, and oh my God. <laughs> and I only buy oh my gods. It's been a very successful way of looking at things. Unfortunately, I have the ability to determine what is good, very good and great. And I buy great. Has the coronavirus changed your life? I'm sitting here in Florida where I would normally be in New York City now. I'm in New York now. Um, often, but not the way I was in the past. And as far as going out and traveling, I have not been able to travel to Europe. Your country is locked down in many ways. I can't travel to Milano. I can't land in Rome. So it's a major problem. How do you normally organize this life of philanthropist, collector, businessman? Thank God for the Zoom. I'm on Zoom. Yes, there was on Zoom seven times. And when people have something to show me, they sometimes will show it to me on Zoom, piece of art. Or I do my business on Zoom. I do my travel on Zoom. Isn't it frustrating to see the objects or the paintings or whatever from Zoom without touching them? I need to touch them. I need to see them. At the same time, what I would do is often I would have them sent to me. I only buy all oh my God pieces. <laughs> I only buy things that I feel... This is a unique opportunity. And, and that was the case uh, of this very, very famous Gustav Klimt uh, that you call Mona Lisa, Adele Blockbauer. Exactly. You saw the woman in gold, the movie, uh, you realize how difficult it was to get. It took me seven years of working with different people in different groups and with the family to finally get the picture. Because the picture was uh, somehow stolen by the it Nazis. Nazis and put in a museum. And finally, because Austria changed their laws and decided to do restitution, that I was able to get it. Now, your country is particularly difficult for art 
because men, a great deal of art is blocked by your government from leaving the country. It's a shame because these pieces are important for the world to understand a lot of the things that Italy has, and um, it's blocked. But at the same time, I understand the desire to keep many things in Italy for Italian people. As you created your own museum, the Neue, and you gave some fantastic pieces of your collection to the Met, and your brother also gave a very important collection to the Met, you must be very passionate also by museums, right? I was the chairman of the Museum of Modern Art. I'm on the board of the Getty, so I'm very involved in different museums. Do you think that the prices of some contemporary art Artists uh, are excessive. Every piece I bought in my life, I paid too much for. And it turned <laughs> out that in three years after that, five years after that, I got a bargain. You never know. If you buy a great piece of art, be it modern or ancient or made yesterday, you never know what's going to happen with that value five years hence, ten years hence. You can never tell. And is it very different from business? In the case of business, you work on it every day. In the case of art, when you buy a piece of art, there's nothing you can do but just wait to see what happens. You can't promote the piece. You can't market the piece. You can't do anything like that. But also, when I buy art, I buy it only because I love it. It's a great piece of art. I never think of its future value. You created, with your brother, foundation to fight against Alzheimer. What is the feeling? As we get older, we risk having Alzheimer's. And we are doing everything we can now to, I think we're the second largest charity in Alzheimer's. At least 25% of the tests being done are products that we found and are working with. We have things called biomarkers where we can determine when someone is younger if they could get Alzheimer's and what can be done. We can see many different things. We also have drugs now that will slow it down. We have drugs. We know that there are many different things we can do. And what is your relationship with these two quite different worlds that are developing now? One is the technological world and the artificial intelligence and all that. And the other one is this green movement that is growing more and more all over the world. They're all tied together. Technology will be something that may save this earth. Technology is something that's changing man. It's also learning, learning about health and technology. And it's one world, and it's time to learn how to read the future. And how do you read it? The world is constantly changing. We have limited resources. And we must do, the, do everything we can with them. We must change and fix up global warming. We can affect it but it requires a great deal of effort. We have to stop coal mines. We have to stop different things going on. You don't change it from one day to the next. It's a five or 10 year effort. And unfortunately, we're not putting enough time into the effort. People are thinking too much of today and tomorrow, and not about what could be. Even more so in politics. People don't think about the future. All they think about is what can they, what can they do to get reelected? What do you think about Europe and what's going on here? They did the stupidest thing you could probably do on this uh, vaccine. They were so concerned about each country having them doing their own thing. When they did it together, they got the people who were experts on how to do tariffs. And these are the ones negotiating. So the result is they took longer than they should have. They try to get the prices down, things like that. When you're dealing with a pandemic like you have, You don't worry about prices. You worry about just getting the vaccine to people. And it's disaster. In America, it wasn't so good at the beginning, right? No, but we got it right after a period of time. Europe has not gotten it right yet. I don't know. I think that Boris Johnson made a good choice yeah. to decide yeah. to vaccine everyone. He did it because he was not in the European Union. 
And I believe that the Italian Prime Minister Mario Draghi is now doing the same. I mean, I think the first priority of his government is to find a way to fight uh, very strongly against... You lost six months to a year, and you lost some very good people because of it. What a shame about what could have been done. But nevertheless, you still are positive. We have no choice. You have to be positive. You don't sleep, you, you die. <laughs> if you're positive and you have feelings of optimism, your chances of living longer are much better. Once the pandemia will be over, what do I'll you want to do? I'll be the first plane to Europe. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much for your time. Bye-bye. Thanks. Alan Elkan Interviews.